have uh, what I believe it would be a very interesting uh, discussion uh, touching on various issues that are very pivotal uh, and timely as well as we keep on discussing um, the relationship between uh, content and the internet. So, uh, before I introduce our team panelists, uh, I would like to provide a little bit of a context. Uh, so, imagine a world where the internet, for example, is private and uh, the access and ability to use the internet is controlled and it's given to the directors. And unfortunately for all of us, we're not even close to there. However, this is not uh, a scenario that cannot happen. So, what we are going to be discussing today is the value of access, the value of content creation, and the value of open internet. Three great uh, uh, and essential things. Um, for access, there, is a, there have been many, many discussions on what access is. We, we, have, we see access as in access to information uh, and its ability actually to act as a social, economic, and political driver. We see access as a means to communication. And of course, we have access as um, a collaborative tool for creativity. Uh, the internet, in that sense, is a key driver because uh, it opened and has broadened many horizons, making creativity limitless. Um, and the, the, the content creation now is actually a key part of uh, the internet. We have not seen so much content being created before the internet. Any form of content, it doesn't really matter. And this content creation actually contributes also to the uh, evolution of the internet, being a driver to incentivize, uh, incentivize innovation uh, at uh, the technical level. So, uh, our panel today is comprised of uh, a group of people that come from uh, different perspectives, but they all share. Uh, one common value, they all agree that content creation is essential tool for the internet. And they all agree, I hope at least, I'm not sure they do, that the value of the open internet is also important and needs to be preserved. So I would like to introduce the, the, our panelists and then I will uh, give them a minute and a half to two minutes to make some high level comments before we proceed to the questions. Uh, the idea is to have a robust uh, discussion with you. We want to hear what you're thinking. We want to, especially if you're creating content, which I'm sure you are in any uh, form or fashion, and uh, see whether uh, where we are and how we can advance our discussions. So I will start by introducing our first panelist, Susan Chalmers. Susan Chalmers leads Internet Museums Public Policy Initiatives in your own with Internet and Z. She works with staff members and other stakeholders to develop policy positions on a wide area of uh, internet policy issues, including copyright, surveillance, and cyberbullying. Uh, she holds a master's degree from the University of Auckland, a university doctor from Loyola uh, University of Chicago, and a bachelor's in French and Francophone Studies, and a bachelor's of music and piano performance from the University of Michigan. She hails from Kalamazoo, Michigan, in the US, in between Wellington, New Zealand, which is antithetical or directly on the opposite side of the world from Southern Market Spain. And she loves how to ski. Then uh, I will go to Ellen Broad. Ellen recently joined the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions as manager of digital projects and policy. Prior to commencing with IFLA, Ellen was executive officer for the Australian Digital Alliance and Copyright Law and Policy Advisor for the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee, advocating for balanced and flexible copyright laws in the public interest. In these roles, Ellen coordinated a broad coalition of sector members, including Australian schools and universities, libraries and archives, IT companies and consumer organizations. Prior to this, Ellen worked for, law, for the law firm Kingdom Group Melsons and for the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia. Then we move to Andres. Udamuz, I hope I'm not saying that right, I'm sure. Andres is a senior lecturer in intellectual property law at the University of Sussex. He is an international research consultant, has done work for the World Intellectual Property Organization, where he has also represented Creative Commons and NGO dedicated to copyright licensing issues. His main research areas are on the interface between IP and technologies, 
address was published two books, the most recent is Networks Complexity and Internet Regulation. Next, right next to Andres, we have Glenn Dean. Glenn is the Director of Networking and Distribution Technology, Technology at NBC University, which is part of Comcast. He's a technologist that engages with the internet engineering and standards community, seeking ways to enable a safe, secure, and scalable internet with a rich global content ecosystem for creating and consuming all types of content, be it professional, pro-consumer, social, or even pictures of cats. He's a strong believer in the idea everyone is a creator. He does not have a degree, but he does work at a movie and television studio that has made many great films and shows with lawyers in them. <laughs> Next to him, we have Paolo Lanteri. Paolo is a lawyer specialized in IP and a member of both the Spanish and Italian bar associations. He works in the Copyright Law Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization. He recently participated in the two diplomatic conferences that gave birth to the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual Performances in 2012 and the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise pre disabled in 2013. Before joining WIPO in 2007, Paolo practiced in the IB department of the law firm, Uriya Mendes Avocados, LP in Madrid, and worked in the legal departments of the Spanish Collective Society, Sociedad General de Autores y Editores. And last but certainly not least, we have Ari Miano Gemma. Ari is a senior associate, associate of Asia, Hamas, and Partners Law Firm, where he specializes in telecommunications, IT, and intellectual property. He's also a project director of Creative in Indonesia, where he works on the target to promote copyright and creative commons licenses for maximum access to knowledge. Since 2011, he has been joining the Founder Institute, the world's largest early stage startup accelerator, and mentor of IT. Ari holds a bachelor's degree of law from the University of Indonesia. Welcome all, as you can see, we have a fantastic panel. And before we start with the questions, Ari, I would like to start with you to give us a two-minute uh, high-level uh, views on our panel, uh, on our team today. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> I think uh, the importance of the topic of this today uh, today discussion is firstly, I think stakeholders should consciously use the open approach of looking at the complex system. Uh, not only look at the copyright system as the source of income, but also copyright as a tool of a tool to build civilization, to provide uh, the benefit, the real benefit to the community. And yes, uh, the real challenge is the, how to achieve the right, the right balance between the uh, needs of creators and the public interest. Thank you. Uh, uh, Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our workshop. As one of the organizers, I would like to use my first meeting to just tell you a little bit why we did it, uh, why we set up this workshop. Uh, what, why we are looking for uh, this session is really hearing your views, opinions, suggestions on how we could develop a balance and neutral policy. And uh, our goal, of course, is to look at specifically how we keep rewarding creativity, how the corporate system is addressing this uh, side of, um, of the situation, at the same time, how we also maintain a high level of access, and how the corporate system maybe already has the tools for allowing all this. That's the first question. How the first question relates to the development of the internet and the practices of the creators and of course the consumers and the users. With uh, our dream that we have uh, in the future a digital environment where accessing to legally to content will be as easy as accessing legally. So I'm very much looking forward to this open discussion and we can have all of the things. Thanks for the time. So, uh, I think a lot of different views traditionally have uh, contacting uh, 
point out is here that we have a concept in the past where we have creators to be able to other people, filmmakers, and we have consumers. And I think one of the big changes in the industry went out of the fact it has broken down that character. Everybody creates content. If you have a cell phone, you take a picture, uh, you are now a creator. Uh, just today, I took a photo of uh, the sunrise over the beautiful ocean here and I posted that on Facebook. Uh, I now created content that I posted on the internet. And that was something I did in January, which is not which is completely made possible exclusively by the internet. It was a wonderful thing. But we have a problem. Uh, the internet did start to go to the internet point. It was never created with content in mind. It was created with a purpose. Right? And a very difficult goal of a lively moving data from one device to another device. And there was never a consideration for what is that data? Uh, and how do I describe what do I understand about that? And what do I understand about the user who created that content and who is the consumer? And I think that's one of the areas we have to look into is the intersection of policy with the technology. And is the technology uh, driven by the standards that you there to meet what the policy requires it to do? And I'm not sure where we are at today. I think that it would be a, a very positive thing for the chance of the cabinet to go to the policy and make sure that the cabinet in the middle can meet what the policy is going to be. I think it's going to be that. Thank you, Chris. Can I have a Thanks. Uh, I'll be remiss not to uh, start by thanking the uh, contributor agreements for my life. Uh, and I would like actually to start by completely uh, agreeing with the uh, uh, I think that uh, this, this point of the creation of the creation of the internet is, is absolutely spot on. Uh, uh, we are creators, uh, the internet has uh, learned the boundaries of what was considered publication, and what was considered gatekeepers, and that. I think that we are past that. And where we are at the moment is on the access to information stage. Uh, and where I think that uh, we would like to uh, discuss more, not so much on the content creation, but we have a content so that uh, people generally are good at creating content uh, all, uh, all the time. And now we are able to publish it uh, quite easily. Now, where I think that we need to explore more, and governments are starting to do this, and uh, creators and industry, is in the uh, access to information uh, part. And I think that we, uh, we will have to tackle this issue of how the information more accessible to the public. Uh, the libraries are very best for the reasons in the world, which 
Susan who just had a paper of the World Intellectual and Poverty Organization. Uh, Susan, please. Access 
we all know there are several provisions in the federal law, uh, one dealing with the famous communities, which are exceptions, precisely the debt on strike violence, which allow access of the welcome to the permission by the stakeholders, the right holders. Um, and you said that, I, I believe, uh, um, in addition to the law, there is much more than what we have done in this particular situation. And uh, on the second part of your question, what White Hall is doing, what White is doing, I, I must say, I'm doing a lot in the area of the part of the Spark Lab and enhanced access as pretty complex and to our nation. Uh, I would divide the area of fields into uh, separate fields. One is the normal field, and the other one is normal. So, regarding the normal field, uh, I cannot uh, only mention uh, the latest gift uh, of the international community, the market street, namely, uh, facility access to the greater works. For uh, the buying of the This is a major change, a major, major uh, shift in the, in the development of international norms. In fact, it's the first one that I think that does not recognize the new right, does not increase the level of protection, but in fact establish a minimum. Uh, level of immigration exception that member states need to recognize in favor of certain beneficiaries. So this is a big change that uh, is already uh, influencing the discussion in the exception. Of course, I don't have time now to dig in, but in terms of the corporate framework internationally, there is much, much more to say in terms of the scope of the but it uh, has a, um, a great power to uh, enable the new discussion. In fact, if you look at the new agenda uh, in the White Congress, standing medium copyright and ready right, has two other items for additional exceptions. One in the field of libraries and archives, and the other one in the field of educational and research institutions. What those institutions need in order to be able to keep uh, delivering their mission. We need an uh, uh, international framework, minimum, set, uh, minimum level of international exception to be uh, recognized internationally to allow them to keep doing their job. That's a discussion that is taking place in the UK. So, White Board is very open, it's not a general member state, are very open to the discussion. And uh, I think uh, it's very hard to. We are in a very early stage of our negotiations. But still, uh, I believe that it's a really big change, and even the discussion itself is going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot to, to, to create new ideas and new ways forward. On the norm, non normative uh, side of things, I could be talking for hours. We, we, we could at least the thanks on the issues, but I would like to pick a few of them uh, particularly relevant to me. So we have the white board of the development agenda. Meeting all the historical details is the set of recommendations that our Wednesday gave to the organization, saying that please keep in mind development consideration in the IP phase. This is cross sectorial, it goes from how you manage in general, how you select consultants, how you develop technical assistance, how you develop process. Of course, it is recovered. In this context, we have a specific project on the public domain, which was raised the way to consider the funds. The public domain, which is the other side of the barrier, which is not protected by the private. So we published a study a few years ago, it's called this study, which, which I, uh, I suggest everyone to read, because uh, it really the first step, the very important step, the objective of the study was to inform and raise the awareness to understand of our public situation, because it's very different to talk about public domain, open licensing, limitation and exception, open access, education, are all very different issues, and technically speaking, very complex. 
you, if you want to advance, you need a focus extension. Coming soon, we have a, a, a new study on copyright relinquishment, sponsored by our friend Andres. And, um, and also, we have a, a, a full new project that will uh, grow through the, uh, the screening of member states in uh, next, next month, in November. Uh, it's called uh, using the corporate system enabling access to information and creative content. The title is financial to tell me what it's all about and we take a new completely new area that what was not developed in this moment. Finally, and I know I already passed time, what was already uh, started the path revaluation of our own journal IP and corporate policy. Together with uh, several other international organizations, we discuss and we set up a working group to negotiate with creative partners a portal version of uh, the Commons license to that will be uh, compatible with our way of function. So it's a matter of we will be releasing the Creative Commons license that will sort of standardize and I see here the world standardization and a positive one, positive development, they mean that would be interoperable with other credit commons licenses on the globe and it will potentially sort of be the standard for all the material created by the information agency. So as you can see, as you can see the, the international uh, community is deeply engaged in which we discuss today. We recommend there are a lot of challenges, but we stand already in the back of that. Thanks so much. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, may I ask? But also, uh, you know, we are a little bit brief uh, on our responses, um, so we can go through all the questions. Uh, Ari, I know that you are working uh, closely with the Creative Commons in Indonesia. Would you like to react to that? I mean, we just had about a new collaboration between uh, various organizations. Uh, Creative Commons will also be uh, one of them. Would you like to respond to that? How you know how the copyright system support the creation of content access to information, especially also related to Creative Commons? If you can be brief, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, basically, as Mike always said, that the Commons license is just uh, part, a small part of the copyright system, and then. Uh, any rules or regulation or uh, any provision in the Creative Commons license also uh, uh, adopt or not harmonize with the national copyright regulation. Uh, the challenge uh, to, to implement the corporate, uh, Creative Commons license in Indonesia is uh, how to educate people about the copyright itself. Because the copyright system is, yes, very uh, complicated issue. It's a very complicated issue, and then we have to educate people about copyright first, and then uh, we introduce the copyright, uh, the Creative Commons license. Uh, according to the, the related to the, this topic about the uh, content creation, content creation, open, open information and access. Copyright and access to information. I would like uh, to, uh, to, uh, to give an opinion that, yes, I uh, follow say that there is a concept of uh, uh, limitation and exception in the traditional copyright system. That, uh, yes, any, any regulation, any national regulation has the concept of, of exemption and limitation in the national copyright regulation, but it can, uh, it's still not um, socialized or uh, disseminated to the people. Because, uh, yes, uh, this is very complicated uh, issue. So uh, I think uh, the, the, uh, the, the duty of the government or, or CSO related to the, to the, related to the uh, uh, internet activity is uh, to optimize, to, uh, to, optimize the, to optimize the exception and limitation of the copyright and the government so be encouraged to make a clear provision about the exception and limitation 
so people can easily understand what can do and what cannot do to the operating materials. And uh, if if the commission is not is still unclear, then uh, we uh, like like a response initiative that we encourage uh, the community uh, with the specific activity to make a best practice or guidelines uh, to. To, uh, on what can do to the operating materials uh, related to their activities, like library, uh, librarian, uh, community, like uh, photographer, and then uh, and so on. Uh, right. So uh, this uh, uh, will be benefit for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. So we had uh, a lot. Uh, we had the word education. We had creative commons. Creative commons. We know that the light of that was created. It was a big internet. Uh, and I would like actually to turn to Ilan, and I know that uh, this is not what you the, the order, but because of the, the, the concept of education, and we, there are a lot of people out there that they don't really know how the internet works. And we talked about the open internet a lot, and you uh, mentioned as well that, you know, of course you're doing a lot of work uh, for this open internet of the levels of the legislation. So, the internet is premised on an environment where open standards were liberated. You know, it is interoperable and it has a generic nature. So this, uh, these are the advantages that we all need to preserve, and we know that. In what ways does this process of standard development facilitate the creation of content, you think? And can it ensure its protection? And I know, by, uh, I know firsthand that you're doing a lot of work on that because I've seen you doing it. Thanks. Um, well, we're hopefully from Margaret, too. Uh, yeah, so. That's a very good question. Uh, you know, the defense organizations historically, uh, I think just read this all about policy neutral. Uh, we have policy, they create standards, and then the policy community uh, with companies that are taking care of them and deploy them, then apply the policy to the company. And, and I think that's actually a good battle in that the policy. Uh, to change over time, and the technology, it does really well to remain neutral, but uh, not to find them. We need to enable policy to be applied, but not necessarily have that policy baked into the technology itself. But I think there's a couple of areas that are, are very important focus that for content of all types. Uh, I attended a panel or a session yesterday on identity, which I found very interesting. Today we have an organized example, I posted a, a picture of someone up on the Facebook, and that was done by Glenn Bean, and went out there and posted by Glenn Bean. But the photograph that I took with my camera doesn't have any real tie other than that posting to be made by me to me. Um, one of the reasons I think that any organization can help with is by giving up the meaning in the way content is provided uh, on the internet and content to move from the internet to start with the association of the content with the creator. Um, and so that it is that an association strong enough that it can then have policies built around it uh, and, and apply. Uh, so you need to start an identification policy, uh, which is something we don't really have as a, a common thing built on the internet. Today we have it's very simplistic authentication protocol that they are used by organizations like Facebook, which have a great connection system, or Google, or a variety of others that are not even on the whole cross platform. These are very simplistic uh, identity models. What I mean by that is that they don't have privacy built into them as well, and part of that is that the policy community is still having extensive discussions on even what that means. But one of these cases that I like to talk about, though actually a lot here, if I create a, uh, a, a picture when I'm 15 years old of uh, something that's very fascinating as a 15 year old, and I post it up there as a YouTube space on uh, me, and then uh, 10 years later, uh, I get people they get, but uh, 10 years later, I'm going to my first big job interview on Wall Street. Do I necessarily want the video that I created at 15 to be associated with finding the candidate for the big job? And today, look at uh, it. Because there is that breakdown of rules. Uh, around identity and privacy. And I think the one way the policy community can help is by creating uh, a set of delineations of privacy and identity. So 
put the end organization thing to build the application protocol that works around that. Uh, likewise, uh, the association of that information with the content that can be important for the pandemic to work on. Uh, within the key network, we're going to talk about this idea of elastic block, which means you know, to the block of the lens taking the content to the block of the person giving the content. Uh, what would be really wonderful to have is actually have an ecosystem that understood content from end to end and understood identity, understood privacy, and did it in a way that was scalable uh, so that we could uh, have, uh, in the end, an ecosystem that was the policy we have developed which set of policies on content that they can then be applied and flow through the, the whole entire creation process. But I think that's the way, if you develop a policy that will help content, because that will empower creators to have control of what they create, where they'll be able to use, be able to express their intent from the beginning of creation all the way through the final step to function. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, I think this is quite refreshing, actually, you know, it's trying to figure out what the standard development process is, especially because of the way they are done and they can actually facilitate the creation and uh, production of content. So, on that basis, Susan, I will turn to you, and we heard about, you know, internet, like talking about internet infrastructure uh, and uh, how that can support. So, what are the necessary tools you think to establish and promote reliable copyright infrastructure that is based on this open and interoperable uh, internet? Actually, provide those incentives that uh, Susan just mentioned. 
and post-59. Right, so I'll talk a little bit about licensing progressive to both the license to your discussions that come from this nation and the health of work that I do not to do it. Because the copyright law has always been about between licensing, the position of the copyright holder, and organizing the exception. And I don't see that the two be like changing as we uh, embrace the internet fully. It will always be a mixture of licensing and the exception organization. What we're seeing in the digital environment though, I feel, is the overreach of licensing in some contexts that impacts on the technological processes involved with the developing new services on the internet. So for example, in the license for Europe discussion, we have been there has been a working group considering text and data mining and whether we should be adopting or considering a licensing approach for text and data mining. And this is something that I think really, at least from a library perspective, articulates the problem with the way some of our copyright and laws and regulations are framed for the internet environment is next to data mining was taking place before we had the internet. It was a lot slower. It involved somebody going through multiple pages, extracting the data, it was an arduous task, but it existed. In the digital environment, text and data mining is a huge resource. It facilitates um, research, uh, huge investment in science and technology, technology. It's becoming a increasing part of academic practice, but it is the technological action of copying that brings it into the framework of copyright law. The use itself was still taking place before the internet. And when we, when I think about uh, the point about incentivizing the creation of new works and how we find that balance in copyright law, that's I think the text and name line in this instance where you are, if you're providing a license for access to a database, then that is your license. It's for access, it's the value of the information inside the licensing on top of that of the act of extracting information is almost I think of that as placing a toll from the information highway. It doesn't add any value to the underlying work. It's kind of just placing a toll booth between your access to the work and what you can do with them. So that's I think a concern for us in terms of these uses that in the digital in the print environment the uses were never within the realm of copyright law, but on the internet, because of the technological presence involved, suddenly um, uh, operating in a space that is both could be um, defined through exceptions, but also is an opportunity to try to extract toll benefits, uh, toll benefits from what are otherwise quite productive and non-public use. So very, very briefly, because I know I'm going to get to the discussion. So, well, the library and archives licensing is an increasing issue because mm -hmm. so many of our core services are being eroded by licenses. Not many jurisdictions have any um, protection of copyright and copyright protection organizations where a contract applies. And we've seen that conversation back in the consumer space quite, quite a lot recently as people realize what they can and can't do with the content that they're licensing. So we have gone to WIPO because uh, Paolo brought up the Treaty for the Mind, which is a uh, great moment for WIPO. And as Paolo mentioned, it is the first treaty that uh, has at its core exceptions and limitations. It came um, behind in recent with the WIPO Internet Treaty and the Beijing Treaty, which were as a site for copyright holders. And then alongside library in December at WIPO, there will also be a broadcasting treaty, so we are still considering kind of additional rights. Uh, so it's great to see such implementations being discussed in the same forum. So for libraries and archives, the purpose of being a white is that these exceptions and limitations need to be considered at, at the international level with the same weight as the rights that we provide to our content creators. And through these international norm settings, we might be able to um, carve out a, or protect some fundamental services from overreach through that. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm glad that some of you know the law uh, as it was uh, speaking. So I will turn to you now and ask you, uh, you know, uh, what Ellen essentially said is that the licensing, the current licensing regime is a little bit challenging for uh, some organizations, more challenging than others, but uh, nonetheless uh, challenging. So 
what do you believe uh, are the future major challenges to creating uh, a healthy and balanced creative content market where creators, artists, and the public are still provided with appropriate uh, incentives? Um, thanks, sir. Um, it's, uh, it's a good question to, to answer in one go, so I'm going to tell you a story to do something like that. It's nice for you to wake everyone up. And this story uh, comes from far away in the land that I'm working from. And uh, um, as part of the uh, 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 groundbreaking uh, effort, the uh, national effort uh, to protect biodiversity, I don't know if by the Costa Rica is the first where we are the biodiversity country in the world. Uh, and a law was passed uh, 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 that created uh, a new institution, a more of a private institution for developing, collecting, uh, storing, and uh, cataloging uh, uh, our biodiversity. So, uh, you know, try to protect against uh, piracy, try to get benefit sharing. And all of this information started being collected by, by this uh, institution called the Institution of the University of it's, it's a very interesting uh, institution because it started uh, uh, founded by a government in, in a way, but at some point it became more of a private, one of those public private uh, uh, institutions. And their choice was to take this information, this data, and, what, uh, and then they started trying to commercialize it. You know, sell it to, 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 to companies and pharmaceutical companies. And the idea was that uh, some benefits would be uh, shared uh, with the country. Uh, to do this, uh, the uh, institution uh, conducted pretty much a very close, very commercial uh, uh, information uh, uh, policy. And I, that wasn't very successful. And I think that the more that we are starting to see how the public information, particularly information like this, that is for the benefit of everyone, should not be kept commercialized. And actually, their commercial efforts did not succeed because pharmaceuticals didn't want to pay them as well. They didn't want to pay government to, to, uh, to do this. There were some agreements uh, at some point, but they did not generate enough funds to sustain uh, this. Private uh, institution. So what happened is that uh, uh, the government had to take over funding again and become public. Contrast that the closing of information, making information less available, with <coughs> what has been happening in some other countries like Europe, where it's now almost a, 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 a de facto uh, uh, consensus that. Uh, information that has been paid for by the public should be free or should be okay, accessible. And in that sense, we see this uh, with the European Commission. The European government has just uh, uh, decided that so it was going to release uh, all sorts of information that have been uh, paid by the public to get into scientific information uh, uh, to, uh, to be able to access. And I think this uh, story of what has happened to this institution, that if you close uh, in the interest of uh, trying to commercialize and try to squeeze some things from uh, information that should be public, I think it does not work quite well. And we should be able to do that. And that's the story we uh, open up sort of open some words. <coughs> Thank you very much. So you heard everybody agree how our time is reacting. Do we have any? Questions so far? We have any more participants? We have no questions. Okay. So I will to you, and uh, I, would, I would like to give you the floor uh, and to ask questions to our panelists, and then we can uh, proceed. But please, anyone, any questions for our panelists? Chris. Chris Martin, University of Massachusetts. Um, uh, question, uh, it's actually two with you. The first is that, well, I mean, obviously we're not expecting the ITU to start using a CC wiper light anytime soon, I guess. But it would be a lovely thought. Uh, 
Um, but I guess the, the, the adoptions of UN agencies would be the free expression. Uh, right. um, and the other question, which actually any of the panelists can take, um, is there's a lot of, uh, a huge amount of concern, I think, not just my community, but more generally about the really uh, uh, vicious way in which e-book stands as a course of program uh, and the refusal to use e part 3, which is perfectly uh, I think it's a perfectly I just wonder how much this illustrates about whether or not rather than holding hands with circles, uh, they have been in the kind of rest of the world. Thanks, please. Uh, I think Paul would like to, to lean in when we can take the second part of the question. Thank you. As you know, I mean, the, 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 you're not supposed to uh, speak in the last few uh, organizations. The way we developed the devices was a very broad uh, work, uh, working group where they did not participate. Because you know, the common devices are open by the issue, so we expect that we have also other institutions, you know, IGOs. In terms of ITU, I don't have any information, but I can tell you they were not part of the discussion. But in addition to that, uh, we are receiving the recently after. Uh, about more and more people who are not in discussion need to say that they want to understand what works and rules. And we are already in the case of the system to improve the United Nations. So, it looks so amazing. Thanks, Pablo. And one point to take, Ellen. I feel I should take a one week from the International Federation Library. It was uh, a huge challenge at the moment for consumers, for academics, for um, those who are visually impaired, for um, libraries and archives. And it's not only from the policy regulatory perspective, what the law is enabled us to do with the concept of licensing, but also from very real practical terms, what happens when you move with your equals that take your Kindle across international borders, whether you can still access the work whether um, it could be amended at any time, whether um, if you are someone with a visual impairment has the technical capacity, even in the circumstances that you do have the exception that says that you could move the design, whether you can actually remove it. Um, I think that we need to be very strong in this and that priority for the library to not have our library is something an article that somehow protects certain exceptions and limitations, um, fundamental uses from override by contract because from at least the library and archive perspective, we're essentially looking at the future if we are living increasingly able where we can't lend content, we can't um, provide it to those um, for certain research purposes, say text and data mining, we can't interrupt the loan. We can't, um, some of our researchers can't print off the documents, they can't access them outside of the library terminal. Um, we can't even purchase content in a number of jurisdictions, and that's a real big issue for access to information in general, both for developed countries, in terms of not only libraries now have, but what we as individuals can do with content, but also for developing countries where that access alone is necessary for development or further innovation. <coughs> So it's a huge issue, and I think that's precisely why, for example, we're at White House. We've moved beyond discussion, we need to be moving to something kind of strong, normal incentives, I think. Because I talked to, we've been speaking to publishers about it, and the answer seems to be licensing. We will eventually be licensing all of these underlying pieces for both the libraries and archives, but for um, individuals who like the language and look to a friend. Um, is that the primary and secondary markets can take care of themselves, but will take care of the issue eventually. So this is the way forward. And I don't think, at least as an English reader, I in the future will want to pay more to make my English to a friend or to have to consider additional licensing or what, again, in print would not be covered in the realm of content. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got uh, yes, a question, Amelia. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mr. Peter, I'm the Board of Supervisors of the Library Department of the Library Department of the Library Department of the Library Department of the 
for my event yes. <laughs> in the same room yes because it's because mine was here room to see palace yes yeah. it's that Therefore, I think the, the main problem in the 
Indonesia is how to educate people about the corporate system in the right, uh, in the right, uh, in the right, uh, in the right way. Uh, not not only just uh, our government, yes, basically our government has uh, do the socialization of discrimination or education to people, but I think this is not in a creative way. So just like uh, you, uh, this is the regulation, and you can read by yourself. This is the articles one, article two. But they don't know the context of the uh, the, the copyright system to to support their when they create something. Uh, like local content and to be uh, to be to be submit or uh, to publish their uh, their local content. So I think um, uh, the uh, the main the main problem is about the education to educate people about the copyright system and then uh, and then uh, to to explain how the exception and limitation in the copyright system so they can use any uh, content. Content uh, for the like the uh, education group posts or research group posts and and so on without uh, uh, violating the copyright owners' uh, rights. Thank you. I think you know you've mentioned the word education and you've mentioned also the role of government. So I would really like to go to power now because you know uh, part of. What WIPO is doing is actually going and speaking to governments, and you're speaking all the time actually to governments, and you know you're promoting the internet, uh, uh, intellectual property system, including copyright. So, what sort of education, if you want, and I'm using the word very very loosely here, uh, is WIPO uh, doing when speaking to those governments, and does it go even beyond to asking governments to speak to their users because of these discussions that are actually happening. I mean, right now, everybody has an opinion of copyright, and we know that we think it. So, please, if you can. Thanks, sir. Ali raised a very important uh, issue, possibly the most fundamental one the alarming lack of awareness of the regulatory system. Uh, people don't understand, don't know the details of the uh, law, and uh, we, uh, I have a to share other opinion from Indonesia and here particularly. And in most, in most also developed world, there is a lack of awareness. Uh, how to address this lack of awareness, um, it's not uh, an easy answer. There are certainly different approaches. Um, on the one hand, uh, there is the problem of we, we should go towards a simplification of the system. Copyright law is complicated, it's complex due to many of these fundamental principles like territoriality, uh, different ways of, uh, of development, and, uh, and the, the formality of reproduction itself. So that's one, one element. In addition, we may want to tackle this issue also with the uh, with social policy, I mean, we may want to have a change in culture of consumers because when we look at how to develop a healthy, uh, well, well functioning digital environment uh, in corporate policy, we are having at the same time for different policy budgets, a matter of uh, economic viability of culture in this country. It's not only a matter of uh, how can I use my Facebook account or how can I use it. It's like we are really concerned all systems and the policy makers. So together with needs, we need to access into low cost of culture, interoperative system, we may want to install also some sort of possible uh, expression like duties of collective wisdom or like those collaborating or something that work also for the other side of the world areas. That's one thing. And the other element we are trying to convey to the government that policy, uh, technology needs to be moved to policy. Uh, I also believe that policy is a new technology and to business. Copyright is about enabling and rewarding creativity, it's not about uh, maintaining a life existing in these models. This is something we are trying to convey, and uh, this links very much with the debate on 
Mr. Vice Management, which are rather rightly defined by the treaties. Actually, there are two components. We always focus attention on technological protection measures, while the treaties also uh, deals with uh, another component, which is rights management information rules, which are essential. They are the building blocks of what we are talking here, like the digital environment. Without this sort of basic protection, collective management organizations are not work. That I mean, all the stakeholders are not work. So, uh, I believe uh, there is a lot to say in which we say, and let me just highlight that, again, recently, the international community has approached this issue of violence. In fact, in the last two weeks of international norm setting, there are provisions, one is on the end of the statement, where clearly state the principle that, for instance, limited to interceptions and trade prejudices should not be overcome by technological protection measures. And it states openly that public domain cannot be gained by technological protection measures. And the, 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 one of the basic uh, underlying principles behind the, the, the Marquez Treaty is the same. So there are reactions, and uh, I think this kind of discussion are very reality and we need to be to keep working with the old governments, but also with the schools. Thank you, Paul. I think we, we have a question. Please, state your name and your Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Maria Maria I come from Barcelona. Uh, I would like to know the view of the panelists on the issue that I uh, imagine in the next play and still playing a great role on the way creation is developed. And uh, I think has been, uh, in my opinion, an advantage on some creative sectors. And I would like to know what is the view of the panel in relation to the way how to legislate on creation and internet. Because I think there is a part of, of an advantage. Uh, we had our rules when we were in the internet, when we were not in this digital world, but in this world, uh, with our object. Now, I think our object is probably and more or less the same ones, but everything has changed with advantages and disadvantages. And I would like to, to know the opinion on, on how. Uh, this change must change also the uh, regulation and its taking in the market. Um, so, it's a question. I would actually recommend uh, anyone who is thinking of, of regulating creativity not to legislate in mind. I think most of the legislation that needs to be in place is the place. Uh, already, uh, we need to fine tune uh, things like uh, exceptions on limitations, maybe licensing of them, and uh, uh, foreign words, little things. Uh, uh, the most important thing is policies that think that, uh, that provide, for example, funding for uh, creation, uh, education programs for the public. Uh, it, so, not legislation, but policy. Uh, policies that foster and uh, try to, to help uh, the, the creative process. Actually, uh, well, uh, no, please. We are now to respond to. Uh, no, we are discussing many issues we have to really uh, touch this morning, so uh, the discussion is a lot of work uh, with the record to get a better use of those things. Um, the problem I see is uh, that many things come still from the old, let's say, analog system. High quality journalism, the main main policy, high analog system, much of the corner. And the mechanisms that work there don't work always well because of the way we have the way of the way how they can deal with the copyright questions. 
because of the internet, this complexity becoming uh, even bigger. So under this framework of complexity, I would like to hear uh, if I'm going to make it for a closing remarks. I will start with Ari uh, and I will move on to Ari. Please, close the remarks. Yes, uh, basically, according to our experience in Indonesia, yes, uh, our government is also, uh, what is it, uh, making, uh, making regulation uh, with adoption of the information or information. Uh, they're always making, they're always adoption and making regulation, new regulation. But they forget to discriminate, to socialize, to educate people about their regulation. Yes, the regulation is good, but if the, there is no uh, education to the people about the regulation, then the regulation will not come as well in Indonesia. So I think uh, uh, the big challenge is uh, how, how can we uh, educate people so they, they can understand about this, this complicated uh, open system? So uh, they can get the benefit from it. I'd like to harken back to 